From Anchored in Faith Gospel Church in Oxford, Iowa, this is Anchored in Faith. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Well, praise God, we've made it through another year. Amen. Now we're ready for a new one. And so the question I guess I have is, do you understand that it's not going to get any better? It's not going to get any better. You think that last year was bad. You are in for another sequel of problems. Uh, it's becoming reality that Christ is coming. I'm mostly speaking to the Christians this morning more than I am to the unsaved. But here in chapter 16 of Matthew, uh, starting with verse 13, it says, Jesus came to the region of Syria, Philippi, and he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do the people say the Son of Man is? If you were to interview people today on the street and you said, who do you think the Son of Man is? I don't think we could even get an answer a correct answer, I'm sorry to say, maybe I'm wrong, but even from Christians today. Everybody in the world is trying to figure out who Christ is. Everybody in the world is trying to figure out what Noah did. Everybody's trying to figure out this, that, where Christ was buried, where he was crucified. And it just goes on and on. And it really doesn't make any difference to me. I would love to go to the Holy Lands and I would like to see the Mount of Olives and I would love to see uh, all the different sites. But maybe it would just be the fact if I stepped off the plane and walked on just the dirt of where Jesus walked on, that would be good enough. Think about that. You see, I'm not there. I'm not at Jerusalem. I'm not at Israel. I'm not at Bethlehem. I'm not anywhere close to there. I am thousands of miles, but I am in the presence of the Almighty as I stand here this morning. And to me, that's good enough. And so when we read down a little farther, it says, Backing up a little, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, still others say Jeremiah, and, uh, and, one, other, and uh, one of the other prophets. But what do you, what, what about you, he asked. Jesus is asking, what about you? Who do you say I am? When Christ puts you into a position... And he hits, points you into a direction. And you make bad judgments. Does that mean that you have failed God? Think about that. Christians today, they sit there and they say, well, I made a mistake. I drank a beer last week. I made a mistake. I cursed out a man last week. I made a mistake. I did this. I, I can't go on because I have made a mistake. I have made, a, we're all sinners. The Bible says we're all sinners, saved by grace. And I don't think we understand the word grace. I don't think we comprehend what grace is all about. But I've made some mistakes. But does that mean that God can't carry me on to the point of destiny where he wants me to go? No. No. It doesn't stop. You see, here's the point I'm making. David sinned some sins like you wouldn't believe. He committed murder. He committed treason. He, 
He had adultery. He did. But yet, he still, when he went back and went before the Lord and asked for forgiveness, he went on to his destiny. God still had a destiny for him. You see, just because you make a mistake doesn't mean that it's all over with. You see, we're going to make mistakes this year. As Christians, we're going to make mistakes this year. But the question is, is how full of you are you with the presence of God? How well are you just playing the game or are you just thinking about it or are you really in the presence of God are you really taking the point now I'm not going to stand here and say well that gives you authority to take and go out and sin every day this next week because of grace I'm telling you that you are going to make some bad decisions now, if you look me in the eye and say, oh, no, everything I decide is going to be because I pray to God, and I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You can pray till the cows come home, and you'll make a wrong decision because the Satan is so strong, and he's deceiving us so much. You can't even go to Walmart. You can't go to the grocery store. You can't go anywhere without something causing you to sin. I'm not even going to go into details. I was thinking about it, but I'm not even going to go into detail. Because you, you ought to understand what I just said. Somebody's going to trip you off. You're going to see something that you absolutely do not need to see. Or somebody's going to see something in you and say something to you. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. But my question is, is do you know who he is? Do you know who he is? And do you know how to keep him in your presence? Do you know how to take and filter through the message you're going to go through? Do you know how to stand up and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Here's the key thing that I cannot figure out how anybody can. How can you go through life without having the Holy Spirit manifesting in you? I cannot figure this out. I don't. I don't know how you can not take and go to 2 Corinthians and not see all the different gifts they're available to you. And you sit there and say, that was for then, not for today. You see what I'm saying? We're in a point of destiny where we need to become to the, uh, an area in our mind who we know who he is. He's not just a man that is, a, that is a, just a story. I, I seen something here the other day that said, uh, why, why would you believe in the Bible? And this one person come across and said, the reason why I believe in the Bible is because it's not a myth. It's actual facts. The, scientists all over the world have proven the Bible to be true. But yet people are standing there. They even, have, they even have proof that a fish actually can swallow a man and regurgitate him in three days. They have proof of it now. So why would you even think of not trusting in the word of God? And people say, well, we have no advice in our life. And that's what, the, that's what the word is for. It's your advisor. It's your helpmate. It's, your, it's, it's the book that gives you the rules and tells you what you can and cannot do. And the, trip, the funny part of it is it can tell you what you can do. How powerful you can become. And people, and we have 
The problem now with the church today that we don't trust in the word of God. We trust in man. We trust in man when it comes to alcohol. We trust in man when it comes to drugs. We trust in man when it comes to uh, mental problems. We trust in man when it comes to marriages. We trust in man in everything, but we don't trust in God. So who is he? If we're going to trust in man, then what do we need him for? Or is it the fact that he is just somebody you just say, well, he was a man that was on this earth and he was a great prophet and he had a little bit of power that he could go around and he could heal. You see what I'm saying? We have, well, I don't think we have, I think we have lost the question in our mind. Who, who is he? Where is he at in our life today? Where is Jesus Christ in your life today? Before you take and you make a, a move or before you take and make a decision on what you're going to do, do you even consult the Holy Spirit? I question you about that. God loves to pour out his blessings. He loves to pour out his blessings. And he'll, and he'll lead you in the right direction through the Holy Spirit. If you would just put yourself aside and put the Spirit inside of you. And I think a lot of Christians today have put them, their, the Holy Spirit outside of them and, put, and as depending on themselves. On what they're going to do. I want Christ to actually take a hold of my hand. And direct me. And the only way I can do that. Is to be filled with the spirit. Right. And I don't think Christians have been filled. With, I th they're so worried. About their selfishness. Yeah there's a word. Than they are about their about their life with Christ. I turn to the, uh, the uh, first or to John, chapter twenty, verse twenty six. It says, "A week later, his disciples were in the house again." Here's the problem: we even got an example, and Thomas was it with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said. Now here's the problem. The other disciples had seen Christ, but Thomas had not seen Christ, and he is doubting. <laughs> doubting. I want to say that again. He is doubting. And we as Christians, here we go, we're doubting. We doubt what Christ would have us to do. We pray, and God gives us an answer. And, he, uh, and, and here's the thing. He even gives you a sign, and you're too stupid. I'm going to say that word. You're too stupid to accept the sign. You'll say, oh, that's just a figment of my imagination. Oh, that was just something that I just fell into. Uh, that was just, you have an excuse for a sign. So here we have a man called Thomas. And all the other disciples have seen Jesus. But Thomas had, and he's going around, all oh, that, you just didn't, all oh, that, just craziness. And Christians today are doing the same thing. Oh, that's just, you didn't, no, that's just craziness. We've got a plan for the church. And this is a plan. We can't allow God to take and be in control of the church today. That's just craziness. That's what, that's what Thomas was doing. He says, you can't possibly have seen Christ. That's just craziness. That's the same thing when you say you can't allow the Holy Spirit to move in the church. That's like saying, I don't believe Jesus exists. But that's not a true statement. You prove to me it's not.
Because that's what you're saying. If you are a Christian today and you do not allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life, if you do not allow the evidence of tongues to be in your prayer, if, you do, if you're not going to allow the Holy Spirit to move the church, that's like saying, I doubt that there's a Christ. If God wants something to happen, you will see signs and wonders. Not only in your personal life, but it will happen into the church because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to move in the church today. And this is where Thomas comes in. He's doubting what the disciples are saying. Verse 26, a week later, the disciples are in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. So, we're going to rewrite the Bible and we're going to allow people to tell us that the Holy Spirit was only for then, not today. And you want me to trust you? You want me to trust you? You don't trust the Lord. You don't trust the fact that the Lord sent us the Holy Spirit to give us a comforter, to give us a direction, to give us something to lead us in a direction of correctness and, and godliness and holiness. You'd rather take your chances and walk out the door with man and trust him. Where is your brain at today? Oh, I believe in the Word of God. No, you don't. You lie to me. You lie to God. Because if you did trust him, you would adapt the fact of Acts chapter 1 and 2. You would have realized the fact that Thomas had a problem trying to figure out that he was wrong. Listen, the man figured out he was wrong. Jesus come along and proved he was wrong. What do you want Jesus to do to prove to you that you're wrong? But you see, that's why the nation is in trouble today is because you doubt, you do not believe. We're all a bunch of doubting Thomases. We don't trust, we don't believe that God exists. Most of the Christians today do not trust, they doubt, and they don't believe. Right. Amen. 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 And I challenge any Christian, I challenge any Christian to pick up the Word of God and find out for themselves what the Word of God says. And if they say that that is not for today, it was for yesterday, I doubt that you are saved. I'll just get ornery about the thing. I think I got 36 cents in our, save, in our checking account right now. And I don't have a... I, <laughs> I'm not worried about it. Because I'm wealthy, because I have God on my side. My bills are paid, thank you very much. We have food in the house, thank you very much. We have a new car sitting outside, thank you very much. The bills are all being paid. But all we've got is 36 cents in our checking account. And Teresa and I are happy. Don't know how we're going to get home and gas. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not true. 
But you understand, we're happy. We don't have a mansion. We don't have a quarter of a million dollar house. We don't have a place to go to vacation in the Caribbeans. We don't have a place to vacation in Florida or Texas or California. We don't have a fancy car. We drive a Ford, thank you very much. If we, if we as Christians don't absorb the Holy Spirit in our lives, you're doomed. You're just doomed. You're in a world of hurt. If we don't get out of this Doubting Thomas situation and realize who he is, We're going to lose. Actually, I'm going to say there's a lot of people that's going to lose. The Bible says there will be but a handful that will be risen up into heaven. <clears throat> so what's that mean? Oh, well, how many? I don't know how many millions of people say that they're Christians. And I'm sitting there going, well, that may be a couple of thousand that might make it. Pass that through your brain. Well, I've heard this before. Oh, they're having Bible study at the bar. And, and they're each taking turns buying a pitcher of beer while they have Bible study. The other day, I just heard something even more ridiculous. Now they got a place somewhere in Colorado where they're all getting together and lighting up a joint while they have Bible study. Yeah. How can you study the Word of God and not be in a right mind. <laughs> Here, Elmer, I'm passing you the other joint. Have another hit. <laughs> well, I don't, I, how I don't, how could Noah possibly put all those animals <laughs> in that, that boat? Think about that. Have the brownies. <laughs> yeah, here, have another brownie, Sister Han. You'll like, you'll like it. Hey, Doug, you want another snort? We got some. We got. We got some MD twenty twenty here. We can. You know, people are probably going, how do you know all this? Well, I was young and stupid at one time, but I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I got saved. We got enough problems trying to get the save, unsaved saved, but now I'm trying to figure out how to keep the saved one saved because we don't know who he is today. Well, praise God. Don't you know that the Quran is right? Mm -hmm. I've heard that. Oh yeah. oh yeah. That's another big deal coming up. That's right. And did you know that at all? Oh, there I heard this just the other day on TV. They're trying to say that Adam had a wife before Eve. That she's the one that's caused, that she caused most of the problem before Eve came into existence. And I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, yes. They were, they, he got, uh, what? <laughs> he created a, a, a problem before Adam and Eve? Well, some believe he was a snake. Some say he was an apple. They ate an apple. Some say it was... Quit! Quit! People can't accept the Word of God for what it is. Oh, we got to dig a little deeper. We got to find out where there was a mistake People are looking for people. People look for Christians 
that made mistakes so they can take and say, see, you messed up, sister. And see, it's you messed up. That gives me a right to go up and do the same thing you did. And that's how it works. You see, David made a mistake. Uh, Moses was making mistakes. He was a murderer. Uh, I mean, you could just go on down the line. All the different prophets that made mistakes, but the problem is they realized they made a mistake. They realized it was a point of destiny that they needed to go for that God had given them. Samson made a mistake, but he corrected it because he knew that there was a destiny. So when are we going to realize who he is and that we've made some mistakes we need to repent because there's a destiny that we need to go to? Why is it that we make mistakes and we just say, well, well, I might as well just sit here and just let it happen? Well, you don't have to let it happen. God gave you a direction, each one of us a direction in our lives. And there's no reason to sit there and say, well, I made a mistake, so therefore I can't do it. I'm a bad person. No. There's hundreds of prophets in the Bible that made mistakes, and yet they asked for repentance, and God carried them through. Right. Joel was an absolute Gee, many Christmas. You're supposed to go this way, Joel, and Joel goes that way. And then Joel gets gets back on the boat and goes in the right direction. And then when he gets there, thousands of people become saved and he's sitting there mad about it. You see, you make a mistake, it doesn't mean it's the end of the, your life. It just means we have a God and we have grace. That's why the cross, there's where the cross comes in. Christ died on the cross because he was a perfect sacrifice for us and for our sins. He dies on the cross and gives us the grace. The grace comes when the veil was ripped apart, not from the bottom to the up, but from the top down, and he gave us grace. And now we have Christ for our life. But praise God, we're going to boohoo. And it's time to quit boohooing. It's time to get on our knees and ask forgiveness and start asking for the Holy Spirit to be a part of our life and be the presence of our life. It's time that we started figuring out that we need a Holy Ghost fire revival in the church and we need to allow the presence to come into us and we don't need the man-made highs that we're getting. We need the godly highs that Christ gave them back in the book of Acts. Think of what they had. A, they had a party and when they got done Everybody in the world thought they were drunk, but they had to explain to them, they're not drunk with the hard stuff, they're drunk in the spirit. And when they got done, they didn't have a hangover. But they knew who they were. They knew who Christ was. Think about it. We need the Holy Spirit to come into the churches like a rushing wind and blow the churches apart and allow the Holy Spirit to come. And we need to have a drunken party in the Spirit of the Lord. And then when people can realize what happened, they get up and realize, now I've got something. I don't need this. I need that. I don't need what's out there. I need what's in here at this altar. So who is he today in your life? That's my question. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204. Oxford, Iowa, 52322. 
or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.